you have to turn the microphones on. Guy, microphones are hard to use, and I think that's one lesson we've learned this Skepticon weekend, among many others. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is an ex-Muslim atheist feminist who has written at Skeptic and Freethought blogs. They now blog at The Orbit, a social justice-oriented network of which they are a co-founder. Please welcome our last and coolest t-shirted speaker of the weekend, Eli Hanna Dadaboy. Thank you, Lauren. It is an honor to again take the main stage here. I always make Lauren give me a workshop, so it always ends up happening. But when I get actually invited to be up here, that's always extra great. So uh, since the theme is family, I decided I'm just going to take on that topic head on, partially because I have a minor suspicion that some of you here might have complicated relationships with your family for various <laughs> reasons. Just a hint. So uh, let's, let's talk about this, let's talk about this. But first, I'm going to give a little bit of a content notice. Obviously, I'm going to be talking about family conflict, because you can't talk about family without talking about family feuds. Um, I'm going to touch on trauma and abuse, not super in-depth. Um, I am going to be showing some racist imagery, believe it or not. Um, you know, if, I, I will warn when that comes up. And we're going to be touching on death. So, you know, no judgment if you need to take a break or, sh you know, not look at the racist imagery. So I'm going to put all of you on the spot right now if you so desire. So we're gonna do the whole corny thing where we raise our hands and keep them up or put them down. So, raise your hand if you have any living relatives from your biological slash legal family of origin. If you have any who are still alive. All right, put down your hand, or keep it up rather, keep it up if you have any of them that you still talk to any of them, whether that's a great aunt, cousin, whatever. Okay, some hands went down. Uh, how many of us could say that our families know who we are more or less? So I'm not saying that you have like detailed descriptions of your sex life, but they, they basically know who you are. <laughs> how many of us could say that our families acknowledge who we are more or less? And how many of us can say that we don't have to censor ourselves around our families? There it goes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that we're all in, in, it's complicated, right? Facebook had it's complicated. Oh, you can all put your arms down, <laughs> don't worry about it. D don't tire out your arms. We gotta dance later, okay? So uh, most of us have some kind of complication with our family. Facebook used to have an it's complicated status. It should have been for family, not romantic partners. Uh, we're not exactly a majority, those of us who can say there's estrangement or other dramatic things involved, but those numbers are going way the hell up. So estrangement issues are up all around. This is not just in the United States, it's all over the world. If you go into parents' forums where they are estranged from their children, they will talk about how they loved their kids too much and that's why they're estranged. Or they'll say, our kids have no respect who raised those kids though? You gotta wonder. Or they'll claim that a kid's spouse or romantic partner turned them against them. Or they'll say their kids are hard and unforgiving and cold. On the other hand, from the side of the children who are estranging themselves from their parents, you hear stories about abuse coming to light. You hear stories about how people feel that they no longer have to be loyal without question to family members who might be a Trump supporter or whatever else that they have a problem with. There's also a movement towards us understanding and healing from our own trauma, and sometimes those who gave us that trauma are not super helpful in that journey. It isn't really a new thing, this idea that we can heal from trauma and move forward and get rid of those in our lives who hold us back from that kind of healing. It's really a reclamation and a modernization of rituals, rites, and processes that have been in basically every culture since forever. Not to be super woo about it either, it's science, and if you read this book you'll see it's called Burnout by the Nagoski Sisters, and they talk about how stress is a cycle that we have to complete. It's not just about reducing stress, but most of us are carrying a stress burden, essentially. 
And so we're all starting to, you know, maybe unlock, heal from all these things. And we find that people who are resistant to the concept are just an impediment to it, right? I would say that there is one incident that I can point to where I realize that there's a fundamental difference between people who have been, are, or who have ever considered estrangement from their families versus people who have never. This is a story about a weirdly unconsciously racist thing that someone once said on a random Facebook group. I know, it sounds real exciting. So I'm in a group, a very highly specific group on Facebook, about neurodivergent people and how much trouble we have with basic humaning tasks like cleaning. And we share little tips and tricks and little brain hacks for you know, getting ourselves to clean up more. And bed sheets came up and staining as can you know, happen. And somebody in the group claimed that those with a darker skin tone stain their sheets more. And I immediately go, oh, oh, oh no, because all I'm thinking is these ads from back in the day where they claimed that darker people were dirty. So I, you know, I tried to be in good faith though. I responded and I said, D do you realize what this sounds like? It doesn't sound good, friend. And her response was, she has a family that is Mediterranean and they range in skin tone and within their family, they have a belief that those in their family with darker skin do stain the sheets more. And I'm like, yeah, but that has implications for other people too. And she said, I never thought to question it. And I realized, oh, people who have never had a reason to question things within their family sort of walk around with beliefs like that, which sounds really fake to me, but apparently some of you are like that. And I realized that what lay underneath that was trust. Trust is what most people think makes a family. It's sort of this mainstream idea that you don't have to earn trust within your family. You trust them, they trust you, you just sort of move along in that way. So if you have ever talked about having problems with your family or cutting off contact, I'm sure you've heard, but they're family. Most people who say that kind of suck or just don't realize that they suck <laughs> because there are tro toxic traits within the co traditional concepts of family. Uh, you know, if you have built into your family the idea that you have to unquestioningly obey, you're probably in a more hierarchical family structure but even less hierarchical families have their flaws because the idea is you always give your family credit. You don't fight them too much, you hold your tongue, you assume they're good people always acting in good faith, and you accept them no matter what. Of course, that has downsides <laughs> for the whole world sometimes. You get your traditional crime families. And even in those families, there are people who aren't biologically or even through marriage related, but they'll say, we're family, you know, the family. Then there's cults, which is a whole other thing that I'm not going to get into, but they often have pseudo family structures because they're banking on the idea of trust. We consider you family now, which means you can't question us and you got to listen to us, which uh, plays into this idea. Oh, I switched the order of the slides there. When you're here, you're family at Olive Garden, right? But it's a very hierarchical relationship, right? You as the customer are getting your ass kissed by some poor underpaid server in the hopes of maybe you giving them some money so they can pay their rent. So it's another hierarchical model, which plays into the idea that you should want to work to benefit the American society that is sort of like a family. You know, you have to want to work even if you're completely underpaid for it and treated like shit because we're a family. By the way, if you ever apply for a job and they say we're like a family, don't walk, run. <laughs> Religion plays into this too, which by the way, as somebody who doesn't come from a Christian background, I find Christianity to have the weirdest family fake structure that's going on. Like Mary and God is mommy and daddy, kind of weird. Father and son is the same thing, but not also extra weird to me. It's all very weird. 
But when I think about Islam, which is the religion that I came from, we all called each other, we said we were brothers and sisters in Islam. Unless you were like a hip, new kind of Muslim and you'd say, we're all brothers and sisters in humanity. But they're all brothers and sisters that you can marry? <laughs> like that's just a, ends up sounding real weird. Where in Christianity, the siblinghood is through being God's children, which to a Muslim is pretty blasphemous. God's not allowed to have kids. We are all children of God and he left us in a hot car. And not to mention the extra weirdness that is all the killing of children that happens in the Bible. I guess America doesn't want to be like the Bible, so we're banning abortion so that there's less child killing? I don't know. I don't actually consider you know, fetuses to be children. But if you don't know the story of Abraham, if it's, you're looking at the Islamic version, it's Ishmael. In the biblical one, it's Isaac. But God tells Abraham, go kill your son. Go slit his throat. And then at the last minute goes JK and gives him a ram. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I mean, I always imagine Ishmael going, so dad, what was, what was that about? <laughs> what happened just there? So if we pivot away from the idea that the people to whom you owe some kind of genetic or other allegiance, and you move towards the concept of chosen family, I would be remiss by not starting with the queer history of the idea of a chosen family because a lot of people on the LGBTQIA, et cetera, spectrum end up becoming separated, whether physically or partially or fully emotionally, from their families of origin. And so we end up creating these, what we call chosen family structures. And in fact, back in the day, if you're an old gay, you know this, you would ask, are they family? And that would mean either that they are also gay or they are an ally. That's what family meant. And back then, ally inclusion was important within that definition because there were so few allies. Now, well, before it used to be that sometimes people would hide in the word ally to not come out. I did that in high school, by the way. I was in a headscarf in the Gay-Straight Alliance as an ally, very aggressively doing all of the activism. And, you know, that came back to haunt me. So, you know, people would hide in the ally identity and now they're more likely to actually come out. So now people hide behind the ally identity. I'm an ally, therefore you cannot question my behavior. So again, the concept of family comes up again. You should believe that I am part of you and you are part of me, so anything I do is fine. There's also a concept that's sort of newer within queer circles. It's not that new, but it's newer as far as terminology goes, which is the queer platonic partner, which people outside of the community go in and, and say, isn't that just best friends? But it's not. It's basically someone who you may or may not have sexual or romantic relationship with, but who is very much family to you. So these concepts have been around for a while. And not even people outside of the LGBTQIA spectrum are starting to pick up on the idea of chosen family because there are more reasons to be estranged from your family. But there's downsides to this too, because once you put the term family on it, often all of the baggage of family comes up and we end up replaying the same patterns that we brought with us into the space. It took me a long time to figure this out. I hope all of you have by now. Just because you have certain things in common with somebody doesn't mean they're going to make good family for you. A lot of us found that out when we thought everybody who called themselves an atheist would be on our sides. We all know that's not true. <laughs> the great schisms happened more than 10 years ago now. Then there's the issue of sexual and romantic tension because generally speaking, depending on where you're from and who you are, I guess, your family of origin, there's not gonna be a lot of sexual or romantic tension between members of the family. But within queer chosen families, that can happen because there are people who are around who maybe you dated before or want to date. So while that's not necessarily a bad thing, it does add a variable to the equation. There's also the issue of, do you always stand by everyone within your chosen family or what is the action that they take that's far enough for you to say you are no longer part of my family? 
because estrangement is difficult, whether it's chosen or family of origin. There's also the concept of a statute of limitations. So I find this happens between all kinds of families. But there are people who believe that even if you said something 10 years ago, as long as you haven't contradicted it since, you must still hold that belief. And then there are people who seem to believe that if I said something 10 years ago and haven't validated it since then, you can't hold me to it. And because we don't have these explicit conversations about how we think about it, it, it ends up call, causing clashes. I'm in the uh, second party, <laughs> or rather the first party. I really don't think that if you say something to me and you never contradict it, why should I think you believe the opposite now? What reason have you given me? And that causes conflict. Hopefully we talk it through as a crew. If you know, you know. The idea is that maybe before we have conflicts, we should discuss how we have conflicts. People talk about love languages, and it's a concept that has limited utility, and I know it comes from Christian writers, don't at me. But there's also a concept of apology languages. If somebody has truly done your, you wrong and truly wants to make amends with you, how do they approach that? The worst time to have that conversation is after they've pissed you off or you've pissed them off. You're not in a place to actually have a good, healthy conversation about what is right. So radical idea, maybe do it while you're on good terms. Like a prenup, right? <laughs> Say, all right, we're having our little friendship or whatever other relationship discussion about if I really mess up and I know I did wrong, what do you want from me? Do you want space or do you want me to close the space between us? Do you want an explanation of how I messed up, how I got to that place, or do you just want me to say sorry? There's so many elements to apologies, but we don't have these conversations ahead of time and it causes all these conflicts. And if you're at all familiar with the concept of the geek social fallacies, and if you're not, you should look them up, there's a lot of issues that come up because we assume a transitive property. If I like somebody, they will like everybody that I like. That's not true. Sometimes there are things that are incompatible between people that you may not know. Sometimes you may think that someone is misunderstood and misjudged if somebody else rejects them socially. You may think, oh, I was misunderstood and misjudged and socially rejected. So that person over there must also be wronged. And that may not be true. Maybe they actually did something wrong. Maybe they were that guy. Like the ones that came up uh, at last night's panel, if you were there. You know, sometimes you do have to give people the boot in order to make it a safer place for everybody else. There's also this thing that a lot of people do where we linger on the formative years where maybe high school was 20, 30, 40 years ago, but you still think of yourself as that, as that sad little kid crying in a corner, because some part of you still is. But you can't keep thinking of yourself as that person as you interact with other people, because that's not who they know. They're seeing the person they see in front of you. This is a self-crit, by the way. <laughs> so how do we find the balance between the good ideas from the old model versus the complicated, chaotic, disorganized, but dynamic new model. What can we build from this? What can we take from the different sides of it? So I wasn't going to get personal with this talk. That was not my intention. I uh, did not intend to get emotional about it either. But now, as I move forward in this talk, I'm gonna warn you, I might make myself cry. That's because I figured out that now that I have beard and no breasts rather than the other way around, I'm allowed to be emotional. And people won't accuse me of being hysterical. So I'm going to talk about my grandmother who recently passed away. Um, you will not see a picture of her because it's not my place to decide to project her image to all of you. I will be sparse on certain details because not everything is my story to tell. But I think there's a lot there that I can share about my relationship with her. In life, she was a real anxious person. And as a kid, I did not understand it. 
She wouldn't let me and my sister play upstairs because she would worried we, we would crash through the window and fall to our deaths. She was that kind of person. She also just was very fearful and I just never understood it as a young person. I also didn't notice her good traits because as a kid, I just saw her as a blocker, as an impediment to my child freedom. But as I got older, I started to figure out, I kind of understood her. Turns out I am also a very anxious person. It just manifests in very different ways. The thing I most associate with her and that sort of demonstrates my change in mentality is of all things, oral hygiene. She was always on our case to brush our teeth, to freshen our breaths, to learn how to scrape our tongues and do all these things. So she died recently, she was in her 80s. She died with all of her teeth intact. So she was onto something. <laughs> these were her weakness though, the orange Tic Tac. They have sugar in them, they could ro erode your teeth. But even she, the devotee of the cult of oral health, let herself have a Tic Tac every once in a while. She also really liked to uh, use cardamom pods to freshen her breath. It's a very, very Indian thing. So that's me back in the day. <laughs> this has a point, by the way. I'm not just showing off how cute I used to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> aw. Well, I'll go back to this just for a moment. So my grandmother, I saw her as an impediment in many ways as an enforcer of rules, especially around religion and modesty. Because when I used to wear a headscarf, if my skirt came up a little bit and you could see a little bit of my hairy leg, she would warn me to cover my leg. And I remember thinking, why is she like this, you know? And I realized that to her, it was her way of protecting me. And back then, I believed in Islam. And she thought she was helping me. The minute I left Islam, she stopped doing that. Once I said I was no longer Muslim, she left me alone about those things. And I found out years later that one of my uncles, he's not religious at all, and he raised his kids pretty secularly, she never was on their case to be religious. She only brought it up and only tried to enforce it with people who had opted in, which honestly is incredible given the way even much younger people in my family reacted to me leaving Islam. Honestly incredible. So I bring this picture up because I found out after she died the truth about why she kept on loving me even after I left Islam. Because even though the fact that I'm a Muslim who no longer is a Muslim is plastered all over the internet, it's not like everyone was informing all of the elders in my family about my change of, of heart. You know, I didn't go up to them and be like, hey, Grandma, I'm an atheist now. The closest I got to that was saying, oh yeah, I'm not wearing a headscarf anymore. That's about as close as I got. So when my grandmother died, I didn't know if she knew I was an apostate. All I knew was that she had kept on loving me, which did mean a lot, and that she had stopped trying to enforce modesty on me, which meant a lot too. I found out that I was so wrong because my mother, who was, who was very close to her mother, went to her mother for advice as people in good relationships with their parents do and said, I don't know what's going on with my kid. My kid's saying they're not Muslim anymore. I'm really scared. I'm really hurt. I really want to, I don't know if I should cut this kid off to teach them a lesson or keep them in my life. And my grandmother said, she's your daughter. And if sh you decide she's not your daughter, you're not my daughter. And this picture is so, so I divorced my husband who was on the other side of this picture. But this picture still means so much to me because the reason why I looked like a proper Indian bride was my grandmother. Because her way of showing affection about this was to tell my mother when she found out that I had eloped with my then husband. She said, And it means literally make her into a proper bride. So she wanted to make sure my grandmother, or my mother rather, spent the money on it and made sure that I, you know, I got to be the bride. Which really felt like cosplay for me, but it was fun, you know, <laughs> in its way. 
And this was after I had eloped, by the way. She knew that I had secretly eloped, and she still wanted to make sure that I felt like I was a part of things. She modeled a less toxic way of approaching family in ways I had no idea of, and even other people in my family didn't know until after she died and people started showing up at my uncle's house and at her funeral and telling their stories. She was not a black sheep, but she was queen of the black sheep, it turns out. She loved every single little black sheep in the family. I was not the only one. You know, loyalty can be bad and it can also be good. In my grandmother's case, she managed to walk the line. She was never blindly loyal to anybody. In fact, she almost cut off one of her nephews because he had abused his daughter. She ended up just kind of distancing herself from him, but kept in touch with the daughter. She kept the daughter in the loop on the family and she made sure that any event that her dad was gonna be at, or not gonna be at, that the daughter was invited. And she stood up to abusers like my own father in her own way. It wasn't dramatic, it wasn't loud. It wasn't the way I would do it because I'm pretty dramatic and loud, but she did it her own way. She also did something that was very controversial for her time and in her cultural context. So within certain cultures, and actually within American culture, not too long ago, it was acceptable to marry your cousin. Please hold your ewes, okay? It's a very modern thing that y'all don't marry your cousins either. Very modern. And it was actually based on racist ideas of uh, social Darwinism. Look it up. It always goes back to eugenics, right? Everything is secretly eugenics in America. So in any case, my grandmother, despite being from a culture that was very accepting, if not advocating cousin marriage to keep the wealth in the family, that, that usually was the mindset, uh, and also from sort of you know a culture and religion where that was allowed, she always refused any offer of marriage that came from within the family. She had five daughters and all the proposals that came from their cousins, she immediately vetoed. And it wasn't because she had some Western ideals or whatever, it was because she said, if you marry two cousins and they have conflict because Romantic and sexual relationships have conflict, turns out. Then you're separating families. You're forcing siblings to go against each other. And she thought that that was incredibly distasteful. So she always stood up against that. So she, you know, she wanted things to be as healthy as they possibly could be. She was also a master of discretion without secrecy. And this is something, as Americans, I'm including myself in it, we're pretty bad at. We have the idea that in order to accept each other and truly love each other, we have to scream every fact about ourselves at each other until someone gets mad and runs off. She was a master of knowing when to say something and when not to say something. It's why she never told me, I know you're a dirty, filthy atheist and I love you anyway. She knew that wasn't the best way to approach me, that the way for us to stay grandchild and grandmother was for her to just love and accept me and show me that she accepted me by stopping trying to get me to do religious acts. My less religious family continued, despite knowing explicitly that I was an atheist, to try and force me to do religious stuff. My devoted grandmother never did, not once, not after she found out. She also had incredible attention to detail and memory. I used to roll my eyes at this, but if I was ever at a family wedding, which for Indian families is like hundreds of people, and they're all relatives, by the way. <laughs> she would introduce me to someone and say, do you know how you're related to them? And my answer was, no. <laughs> and she would go through sort of the family tree, you know, your cousins, uncles, brothers, nephews, former roommate. That's baseballs, actually. But, uh, you know, she would, and it was her way of saying, this is how you're connected to this person. You know, they're not just some rando, they're connected to you, they're here, you know. And there were people who she introduced to me that way who I actually did get genuinely close to. I made friends that way. My mother carries on that tradition because my mother, so within Indian families, if you have a family gathering, there's multiple kinds of bread you can have. It's not just naan. There's like multiple kinds of naan. And usually you have multiple kinds at your family gathering because everybody has their preference. 
My mother knows everyone's bread preference to a T. Not only which bread they want, but how they want it heated up. Microwave, toaster, or oven over an open flame. Or even cold, some weirdos want it cold, you know, that's fine. <laughs> so she knows, and she's just like my grandmother in that way. Probably the most touching thing about my grandmother was that she cared about cats because of me. She didn't exactly grow up with pets. Animals to her were street animals. I don't think she ever willingly pet a cat in her life, but she would always ask me, how are your kitties doing? How many are you fostering right now? Because I'm involved with animal rescue. She would ask me, is there a mom with her babies? And if I would mention it, she would coo over it. Oh, aren't they so cute? And one time she came to visit me in my apartment and she saw the kittens running around and playing and she said, do you have a ball for them to play with? Don't they like to play with balls? Even though she had no idea. And I would do fundraisers for my rescue and my mom's donations would always be matched by my grandmother's every single time. So she would not have pet this beautiful cat named Suyin, but she still showed her love of me through loving these cats. She was also really great at vulnerability and intimacy. She, despite being sort of a quiet, loving type, she always knew who she was and she never apologized for it. And she also never questioned other people's innocent preferences. You know, if your preferences don't harm anyone, why do you care? Which I mean, with families like mine, everybody usually meddles a whole lot. Like, I don't like my food piping hot, I like it kind of lukewarm, I know. Um, and I had relatives who would take my plate from my hands, put it in the microwave, set it to over 9,000, and bring back lava for me to eat, because that's what they like. They're like, why are you eating ice cold food? And I'm like, because I want to. <laughs> my grandmother never, she never cared. And in fact, she remembered how warm I liked it. And that's just an example of just the kind of person that she was. And to go up to my dad, my grandmother never openly rebelled against my dad or said anything against him, even though he was abusive. But as soon as my mother left him, despite being you know, an older person, my mother was worried she'd get rejected. She worried her mom would say, no, you shouldn't divorce. And her mom instead turned to her and said, I can't believe I let you marry that man. She said, you know, I wanted to wait till you had left and you were ready to leave, but I can't believe that I let you and I'm glad you're out. A woman in her 80s from a conservative religious culture. Which brings me to the prayer beads. These are called thespi in Arabic slash Islamic parlance. When my grandmother was dying, she pressed this little baggie with this little set of prayer beads into my mother's hands and said it was for me. And when my mother had gone to see her mother off to her death, I had told her, bring something back. I don't care what it is, just something so I can think of her. But my mom didn't have to figure it out. My grandmother gave her something, which by the way, my grandmother has a lot of grandkids and great grandkids, and she singled me out for this specifically. And my mother didn't tell me till she came back and she pressed it into my hand just like her mother had. And when I pulled it out, I immediately recognized them. Because not only were they the ones she'd been using for years, she had bought it on a trip to Saudi Arabia where she was taking care of me and my sister. And in fact, I had oohed and awed at the Perry Reads with her and she had chosen these because we both liked them. Normally, prayer beads have like tassels that are made out of some weird material, but these have like little chains, which I like because they felt sturdy and they felt cool. So I knew exactly what she was trying to tell me. She wasn't trying to tell me, you better be religious and pray on these. She was telling me, I have always loved you and I will always love you. So even though I'm not a praying type by any means anymore, these have a special place in my heart and in my life. So now when I consider, excuse me, so now when I think about a positive, healthy model for what a family should be, yeah, I think about the abstract. I gave a whole talk about it, right? Yeah, I think about patterns and social issues and social cues and chosen family versus family of origin and the complications that come along with all of that. Of course I think about all that. But nowadays, I, I try to focus more about what I can do and who I can be. 
I can't make everyone be nice to each other. I can't make people talk through their understandings in a calm way. I can't force people to be generous and charitable in their interpretations of each other. I can't get many members of my extended family to take my side over my documented abusive fathers. What I can do and what I hope to do, to be a person who keeps and maintains strong and healthy family ties whenever and however I can. And even though I might be living and looking like a very, very different person from my grandmother, which I am, basically what I've landed on is be more like Nanima. And uh, that, that's about it. I think we can do questions now. That is my co-cat dad, Junpei. <laughs> she is very cute. We'll leave her up. And I saw another hand in the back, I believe. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's one of those things where we can't really know for sure, but we know it goes back as early as like the 20s and 30s. It's true, you know, and there's a parallel there too because, you know, you are more likely to be abused by your family if you are LGBTQIA anywhere around there. You know, I don't, I didn't exactly come out at a young age. It took me freaking forever. But my dad picked on me more than my siblings. That definitely happened. Sometimes abusers just pick up on certain vulnerabilities and they go after you for them. And he knew I was trying to prove myself and that I would do anything to prove myself. I was actually a golden child, but he was harder on me because of it. My sister was a scapegoat, but as adults, we switch roles. So we get to commiserate about how both roles suck and fuck abusers. <laughs> really, the grass is not greener, I promise you. Uh, any other questions? No? Yes. Yeah. That's a really interesting idea, sort of the interplay between chosen family versus family you don't choose. I actually, a long time ago, like when I first became an atheist, like 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, I had someone in my family who was fine with it at first, but then completely distanced herself from me. 
And I felt comfortable enough with her where I reached out to her and I said, what's going on? She said, oh, you keep talking about chosen family and you say chosen family and not family of origin. And I said, I've still chosen you. You know, you can be my blood relative and I can still choose to add you into my chosen family structure. I have kept you in. You know, you can do that too. And it's, it's true, most of the people in my blood family, if I was not related to them, how would I have met them? At the mosque? Like, no, it wasn't gonna happen. Or even someone like my mother, it, it brings such a valuable perspective into my life that I have people in my life who are religious and a little bit more traditional and who don't live on the internet <laughs> to give me a reality check. To give a quick example, it's a little bit, uh, but here we go. So when the Elliot Rogers shooting happens, my mother asked me, what was going on with him? Was he some bullied child? And I had to explain insults to her. And she looked at me and she said, why do you know all this? <laughs> and I said, Ma, I ask myself that every day. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, th they're both equally as valid, and you can build your own, you know, you can cobble together whatever you need. Yeah. And in the case of relatives who kept me in their life, they really did choose me. They chose me over the entire community turning against me, people within my own family turning against me, their religion telling them I ought to be shunned. They chose me over that. That's a big deal. And I give them a lot of credit, and I extend a lot of generosity to them because of that. And it wasn't just the apostasy, by the way. I've had multiple things over the years come up where more and more people shunned me from my former community. But some people have stuck around anyway, and they still love me, and that means a lot. They chose me too. That's true. Yes. I mean, it does help that I have a giant family, so statistically, <laughs> they're more likely to be the one who can put up with me. Yes. I think that has to be the last one, or where are we on time? Oh, oh, okay, more than I thought. Okay. You, you, you kind of know the answer. <laughs> it's okay. I, yeah, no, I'll talk about it a little bit. Yes, I know. So chosen family is tough in so many ways that I barely touched on. But one of the things that is really hard is when there's a breakup of any kind, platonic, non-platonic, whatever, and people sometimes choose sides or there are accusations flying of various kinds and you're not sure what to do or if you should do anything. You may feel obligated to pick a side, or maybe you yourself want to sort of keep things discreet, but things pop up, or the other person starts talking smack, and you're like, well, I guess I have to know. <laughs> because otherwise, everybody's going to think I'm the bad one. And the sad part is, usually the first person to complain publicly is taken seriously, even though they may not be the right one. So that's tough. And it does hurt more, I think, when you, so think about it. It's not just that they chose you and you chose them and that's, there's an unchoosing. There's also the fact that you're dealing with the trauma of rejection from your former family. So you've already come out of one family structure, at least to some extent, and you're like, okay, I'm safe now. I can choose the people I'm around and I can be choosy. I can use my discretion. I can look for green flags and run away from red flags. But sometimes you're so wrong or they change, or there are things you couldn't have known that come up. I think just the double trauma of rejection can really, really make things worse. 
in addition to the fact that maybe you feel a little sheepish. How did I not know? How did I not see the signs? Am I just not very good at life? We've all had these thoughts, or maybe I have, I don't know. But, uh, you know, that's, I think, what makes it extra hard. And especially because, especially if you're talking about groups like, say, non-religious people or LGBTQIA people, we also feel rejected from society as a whole, not just our families. There are multiple overlapping circles of people who basically don't want us. And so when the unwanted find each other and then unwant each other, it's just exponentially horrific. And it can lead to some pretty bad outcomes. That's not to say you shouldn't build chosen families. It's just to say that it's kind of expected that sometimes there will be bad times. And that you can't be perfect and all you can do is sort of take the lessons, if there are any, and move on. I very recently learned sometimes there is no lesson. Sometimes there is no lesson in bad things. A bad breakup, whatever. Sometimes you just kind of have to pick up the pieces and figure out what you're going to do next. Sometimes there's no secret meaning or code to it. And the room is silent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, it's true, when you have a difference in worldview as fundamental as religion or lack of religion, that can really have a profound effect on how you assess a, a relationship and what you say and how you do. And in case you didn't know, religions have caused conflicts all over the world, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> so of course, interpersonally, they're going to do similar things too. For me personally, and I can only speak to me personally, I do have relationships with religious people within my family and even some chosen people in my life are religious. What it comes down to is sort of what hills am I willing to die on? I ask myself that question. If they say something I don't like or I want to question, I'm like, am I willing to die on this hill? Am I willing to potentially risk something? And that's not to say I'm afraid to engage with them, but occasionally I might say, I think this is a topic we disagree on and I'm not really in a place to be kind in my disagreement with you. Can we talk about something else? Or sometimes it's setting really hard boundaries. That's honestly the only way I'm still talking to certain of my relatives. They kept saying, oh, we accept you, we love you, but then they'd bring up religion. I mean, they bring up religion all the time because they're religious people. It's part of their life. They pray five times a day. They cover themselves. They fast in Ramadan. You know, they're targeted by the Republican Party. There's a lot that goes into being a Muslim, you know? It's part of your life, but... So they're going to bring up religion, and I also had to learn to not take it personally that they brought up religion. Because sometimes they, they weren't trying to shade me. Like they weren't saying, thank God for a nice thing to say you don't get any credit for this thing. They're saying it because that's what they say. Just like I would say, whoop. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same thing. And I mean, like maybe I'm thinking about cats because of this slide, but like cats have different ways of communicating than humans. We just kind of figure them out and try to communicate with them. Dogs, any other non-human animals. That's not to say religious people are a different species, <laughs> but I sort of mentally translate sometimes. I'm like, this is what they're saying. And, you know, it's not black and white. You know, I'll pray for you. We all know it can be passive aggressive and shady. It can also be a genuine expression of, I'm thinking of you. And yes, it bothers me still sometimes when someone tells me they're praying for me. I'm like, can you just like give me $5 instead? <laughs> But, you know, th I think about the people I love all the time, even when I'm not around them. And if their way of thinking about them is to ask what they believe to be a supreme being for good things for me, okay, I guess. I mean, that's not to say I have to pray with them or they can pray in front of me 
It's what they do in their private time. Like, I'm not the thought police, despite what some people might think. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell people what to do in their, in their private time in that way, you know? But yeah, it's a balance, though. I've changed my mind on so many things over the years. I cannot tell you. I don't even remember all the shifts in thinking I had. Because I went from being hypersensitive to being overcompensating to ignoring to putting distance to almost cutting people off. I've gone all over the place because it's an emotional process. And despite what some people who might also think that I'm the thought, you can't not have emotions, by the way. And thinking that you're objective and never have emotions is proof of how overly emotional you are. You're welcome, yeah. Sorry there wasn't a straight answer. <laughs> Nothing I produce is straight, I'm very sorry. <laughs> All right, I think that's about it. Then uh, we can all go get ready for prom a little early. <laughs>